Good morning, Loft. We are in our new series, Waiting. And I'm about to say something really controversial. If fake news wasn't controversial enough for you, right? We like to live on the edge here at Loft. I'm about to divide the room. Get ready for it. There's two kinds of people in this world. There's Mac people and there's PC people. Can I hear it for the PC people? Okay, can I hear it for the Mac people? Okay, so I'm, a, I'm team Mac, right? But I have a Google phone and I just, I don't know if that's like PC. I'm, ta- I'm not talking about your handheld device. I'm talking about where you do your work, your computer, right? And so I love our bulletin cover and I love our bumper, but it's kind of exclusive, right? You know that look? That was the Mac look, right? I hope this is not trademarked. We can't, let's not get caught on our YouTube channel for talking about Mac and PC. But it's that rainbow pinwheel. But I think it's, it's a, a universal enough symbol, right? The rainbow pinwheel pops up when your computer says what? Wait. Wait. The pinwheel goes around a few times. Now, I love it because my computer like never does that. My little MacBook Air, I just get to, the Lord is with me. I just write my sermons, things go good. The little pinwheel pops up every now and again. It just does a bloop and then it's gone. Okay, good, didn't have to wait for long. Not kidding you, this past week it came up and it was going around and around and around. I was all, mm, uh-oh. And then it paused, like the pinwheel froze. That's really when you have to wait. There's something wrong there, it needs a reboot. For the PC people, it's like a little uh, hourglass. Am I right in that? PC, it's an hourglass. Does the hourglass spin? Does it? It's just a circle? This shows you how not PC I am. Sorry. Um, so the rainbow pinwheel of life, waiting. This is a skill that we, as a culture, seem to have lost. Now, I know some of y'all are immediately like, I'm really good at waiting, thank you very much. But as a culture, and that's good for you, but as a culture, we are not good at waiting. We want everything as fast as it can be. Fast food restaurants are like hardly a thing anymore because we have DoorDash and Uber Eats and we get the food brought to us like that. In fact, It shocks me that there's even an option like on the Uber Eats, do you want to schedule your meal to be delivered like at 6.30? No, I want it right now. Why would I get on Uber Eats to schedule a meal an hour and a half out? Who does that? God bless you if you do. (laughs) I want it now, right? We have lost this art of waiting as a a culture. Um, And it's hard to wait. I'm right there with you. I don't like to wait. I don't want to wait. Especially when things in life aren't going too well. I don't want to wait on my test results. I want the labs back now. I don't want to wait to hear back about that interview when I've been out of the job for years. I've been waiting. I don't want to wait on um, getting financial peace. I don't want to wait about these different things in life. I don't want to wait. It's hard to wait. But we meet someone in scripture today in the book of Habakkuk who says, amidst receiving bad news, He says, I will stand at my watch post and I will station myself on the rampart and I will keep watch to see what God will say to me and he will answer me concerning my complaint. Habakkuk commits to waiting on the Lord and hearing from the Lord. So we're preaching through the book of Habakkuk for the next three weeks and I'm going to give you a little overview of this entire book. It's a short book, only three chapters. It's in that category of minor prophets. So Habakkuk himself was a prophet in the tribe of Judah in Israel's history. It's an Old Testament book, if I already said that. And um, 
We don't have that much background information on who Habakkuk was. We actually kind of only have these three chapters from his book, but he made it into the canon. That has got to be like the pinnacle of your, your success as an author, right? Like there's people in heaven who are like, my book made it into the Bible. <laughs> okay, take that New York Times bestseller list, right? Habakkuk made it into the canon and he is there for a reason. And we're gonna look at some of those reasons over the next three weeks. Um, so here's, here's the kind of long and short of it. The first two chapters are a back and forth between Habakkuk and God. And Habakkuk lodges his first complaint. Note the word complaint. He dares to complain to God. And so he complains to God, and he says, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry out for help, and you will not listen? I'm telling you, there's violence, and you will not save us. He's talking about his people, Israel. They are being violent toward one another. They are being bad. They're misbehaving a lot. They're not living according to the Torah, God's law. He says, destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. And so the law becomes slack. And justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. And judgment comes forth perverted. And he's talking about his own people. God, what are you going to do about us? Have you just left us alone to, to be wicked? What, are you going to call us back to you? What are you doing? And God answers. He says, look at the nations and see. Be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. So he says, look at the big picture. Look at the nations. And then God delivers a message. It's pretty hard to hear. God says, for I am rousing the Chaldeans the fierce and impetuous nation. So God says, there's something I'm doing among you. In your lifetime, in your time, you will see me do something that is huge for my people. But I'm rousing the Chaldeans. They're going to come. And they are the ones who are going to deliver your justice to you. That's a hard word. But God doesn't stop there. He, he talks about how terrible the Chaldeans are, okay? Now, I know none of you watch Game of Thrones because we're all a holy and righteous people here. But the Chaldeans were terrible. They were the ones who had like the dragons and the giants and the battering rams. They didn't have dragons or giants. Um, uh, but they had the most, um, they were technologically advanced in terms of warfare, right? They didn't lose a fight. And they worshipped themselves, and they were a very proud people. And so when they showed up, they showed up for violence and for domination. Um, and Habakkuk is like, he, he delivers a second complaint. So the first complaint, he was complaining about his own people. The Lord answered him. His second complaint is, um, I'm sorry, come again? You said what? You said who's coming? What? No. He said, uh, Lord, how can you bring judgment to us, who are kind of acting unrighteous, with the Chaldeans, who are more unrighteous? That's not fair. That doesn't seem just, right? And the Lord reminds Habakkuk. So after he hears this bad news, Habakkuk, that's when he says, I'm going on my watchtower. I'm going to wait to hear from the Lord because this is bad, right? This is real bad. And so he goes and he, he waits and the Lord answers and he says, write the vision, make it plain on the tablets so that a runner can read it. The Lord says, write it so big on the tablets, you can read it on a treadmill. You ever try to read on a treadmill? Good Lord. <laughs> right? That a runner could read it. For there is a vision for an appointed time. It speaks of the end and it does not lie. And he says, 
look at the proud. That's the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. He says, look at them. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by faith. The righteous live by faith. And he, then the Lord goes into um, chapter 2 and, and uh, to the end of chapter 2. He does this thing where he, they're called the five woes. My favorite term for them that scholars have used is called the five taunts. The Lord is like taunting the Chaldeans, right? He's like, what? what? But the Lord describes the unrighteousness of the Chaldeans, their nation, the Babylonians. And the Lord says this. Here's the five taunts. The Lord names the attributes of this nation that will eventually fall because all nations would be held accountable, he says. So the first two taunts, the first two woes, are that the Chaldeans, they use unjust economic systems. The rich were getting richer by uh, charging keeping the poor in debt and charging astronomical interest rates so that the poor could not ever pay off their debt. So the Lord condemns this behavior. The third one is that the Lord condemns the slave labor that they utilize and how they treat humans like animals. They are violent and harsh, and they do not pay a living wage. The fourth critique or taunt um, is that the Babylonians live according to, um, according to like partying. I mean, they party hard. Substance abuse, sexual immorality, all of that. Um, and the Lord condemns that behavior. And then the fifth one is that they are idolatrous. They have put themselves on the pedestal. And so the Babylonians, they worship power, money, and national security at all costs. National security, power, and money has become their God. And this, the Lord says, if because of human nature, all nations will eventually work themselves into this pattern of the five woes. This will show up in all nations who are left to their own devices. And so the Lord says, all nations, not just Israel, not just Babylon, but all nations will be held accountable. So the Lord says, this is what's going to happen right now, but you can trust that in the end, justice will prevail and that everyone will be held accountable. So live by faith. The righteous live by faith. Okay, and then chapter three, it's amazing what Habakkuk does, is a psalm of praise. There's even instructions for like stringed instruments. It's a song, and it's a song of praise. And Habakkuk praises God even though doom is at his front doorstep and his people will be brought into captivity for 70 years. And actually, when they're released, they're so comfortable in in captivity, they don't necessarily want to let go. You know, they don't want to come home. So Habakkuk chooses joy amidst all of this, and he chooses to live by faith. And God says that I will keep my promise, and I will make all things right. There will be a day where there's no more tears, and that all nations will be held accountable. So the first thing that I want us to look at this morning is that Habakkuk, the first thing he does in this chapter is complain. Can you believe that? How dare he complain to God? There's kind of this thing, I don't know where it comes from, it's like American culture, or it's Christianity, or a little of both, but there's kind of this thing where you're not supposed to complain, right? Like, suck it up, quit complaining, like who cares? We all have it hard. But Habakkuk is a faithful man, and he is considered so faithful that his book makes it into the Bible. So we know that there's a place for complaint. Let's be clear, we're not talking about going on Facebook and talking about how your burger was cold at the Beck's Prime. We don't care. Just return it. There's justice. Send it back. Please, speak up for yourself. The, there, 
That's, not, that's complaining in an unhealthy way, right? But there is a place for complaint. There's a place for honesty with God. In our relationship with God, we can go to him and be honest about what we see going on around us, what we have going on within us. We can complain. A Christian word for complaint is called lament. This is also a lament. And we have a long, deep, rich tradition of lament. Did you know there's a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations? It's a whole book of complaints. (laughs) Lament. Over half of the Psalms are laments. There's a place for us to complain to God. There's a place for us to get honest about what we're feeling and to experience it with him. Now, this is like my second to last sermon at Loft, so I'm just saying what I want to say. I'm like so free. And Rob is out of town, so (laughs) I'm just kidding. I want to say to you, and I know some of y'all are going to be that. It's all self-helpy. This is some psychobabble, you know, whatever. Here's the thing. Feel your feelings. Get honest with yourself about how hard life is. Get honest with yourself about what's going on. If we just try to take it in ourselves and, and like just shoulder the burden, it's dangerous Research shows that if we don't process our emotions in a healthy way, it's harmful. The least harm that it could cause, this is the least harm that it could cause, is that it, you, you hold it in and it comes out sideways on the people you love most. Your children, your spouse, your coworkers, they get the worst of us, right? That frustration comes out sideways. It's a whole lot easier to hold your breath out after a hard, disappointing day at work, get through traffic, holding that all in, and then you hit the front door and you're like, why is the house a wreck? (sighs) And you get crazy, right? Sometimes that's a valid question. I see you, okay? But you're like, what is going on? Instead, you could say "It's it's a whole lot harder to feel the disappointment of the day, to acknowledge that was humiliating when that business deal fell apart in that meeting for me. I was embarrassed. It hurt when my boss said that to me. I feel betrayed by my coworker. Do you see the difference? And then you can hit the door and you can say, I need a moment. I had a pretty disappointing day. Or you can say, I had a bad day. I need a hug. Can somebody hug me? You see the difference in that response? It's just a few moments of processing it. So that's the least harm that it could do, is come out sideways on the people you love most. But I think what's a little bit more harmful and research has shown this. It's not, it's not new research. It's actually old, like 25 years old, is that unprocessed emotions, we hold them in our body. And they can begin to make us sick. And so unexplained illnesses begin to happen, right? Your immune system goes down. Unexplained pain or injuries The body under constant emotional stress gets sick. We hold the trauma and the unprocessed emotions in our bodies. It's called psychosomatic disorders. And so it's unhealthy for us to just say, nope, not going to feel it. Nobody wants to hear about my day. Nobody, you know, I'm not, nope, just going to swallow it. That didn't happen. That's unhealthy. That's unhealthy and it's going to cause pain. And here's the thing. It's not only going to cause you physical pain and relational pain, it's going to cause you spiritual pain because you're going to be holding your breath and not getting honest with God either. If you need to rage, the best place to do it is in front of the one who created you. 
He's the God of the universe. He can handle your rage. Your kids can't handle your rage. Your spouse doesn't need your rage, right? God can handle it. He knows what rage is about. He can handle it. If you need to grieve and fall apart, the best place to do it is in front of the one who can put you back together. It's okay to fall apart. He will hold you. You will not fall into despair. He will put you back together and you can walk forward. If you need to scream and cry and shout and do all that, just find your spot. Welcome God into it. And your spiritual life will flourish. It is a faithful response to feel our feelings and to be honest and to complain. It's a faithful response. So also, when we are in these times where doom is at our front doorstep or it's already come in, when there's chaos all around us, it's pretty easy, and it happens kind of innocently, to... um, to focus on how the problem needs to get fixed, right? And, and really, it's a faithful response to say, God, I need you to do something about that. That's okay. But so innocently, we can kind of get it twisted and only focus on what God is doing for us. We get focused on God's intervention instead of his presence. We lose sight of him being with us. God's presence is more important than God's intervention. His intervention is his presence. His presence is the best gift he could ever give to us. With his presence, we have strength for each day. We have manna each day. We have the nourishment that we need every single day to walk into a situation and choose to act differently. He will teach us how to intuitively know, how to intuitively know what to do in situations that sometimes baffle us, right? He will show us the way. In the Old Testament for the Israelites, right? He was a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. He will protect you from the elements. He'll give you some shade when you need it, and he will lead you in the darkness. He will provide for you. When God is around, we have access to the fruits of the Spirit, right? Peace, patience, joy, faithfulness, goodness, all of that good self-control, don't make me make you name them out, right? But we have access to all of that. And sometimes when we read passages of scripture that kind of list attributes off like that, we take that out of scripture and we make it our to-do list. Like, I'm going to muster up patience. BT dubs, you can't really without God. Maybe for a little bit, but you can't, right? I'm going to find peace. I'm going to make sure I'm kind. I'm going to make sure I have self-control. All of that is fine, and that's virtuous to do. But instead, let's take that, let's put it back in scripture and let's see that these fruits, when we see them around us or we see them in us, that means that God is present. And so we are able to find moments of joy in the midst of immense pain. In the midst of loss, we find those moments to laugh and to remember, right? In the midst of chaos, we find self-control so we don't have to reach for something that's going to make us feel better for just a minute but also cause more destruction, right? Drugs, alcohol, porn, these things. In the midst of destruction, we can take a breath and find peace. We can find that our faith is renewed and strengthened. There's gentleness When we're at our wit's end, somehow gentleness shows up and we're able to be kind to ourselves and to those around us. This means that God is around and he is all that we need. I'm going to close going back to that rainbow pinwheel. If you've got that rainbow pinwheel over your head, you're walking around life, maybe your rainbow pinwheel has paused, right? It's not a good situation. 
I don't think Apple meant to do this, but do you remember what the rainbow represents in the economy of God? The rainbow is God's promise. God keeps his promises. And his first promise is that I am with you. His first promise is that he is Emmanuel, God with us. Sit in my presence. Complain. Lament. Celebrate. And everything in between. God is at work. He's fulfilling his good redemptive purposes for us. And we have him for all that we need. Loft, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are here in this space. We thank you that you are at work among us. We thank you that you are a God who is big enough to handle all of our emotions, as scary as they might be to even ourselves. But God, we know that it is the strong path to feel and to bring it to you. God, I pray in this next week that you would awaken us to moments, to opportunities where we can breathe in your presence and that we can observe ourselves and do a little, a little bit of self-reflection so that we can bring ourselves to you. There are some of us who need an intervention. We need you to move, Lord. And so we don't stop praying for healing. We don't stop praying for you to fix things. We don't stop asking you because you are a good father. And you hear your children just like you heard Habakkuk. But Lord, this morning we remember that we don't have to clean ourselves up to come into your presence. You're already here. So come, Lord, and do a good work among us. Do a good work in us. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen.